using a cell phone. I apologize, I'm using a cell phone and I'm reading from a laptop at the same time. So um, I will do my best <laughs> for you to be able to see me, um, but I, it won't look like I'm looking at you. I apologize, um, but I should get started. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for letting me do this this month. And also, I also wanted to say that um, I'm dedicating this Devar tour to the memory of my sister, um, Sharon Goldberg, uh, whose your site is this week. So I just wanted to mention that as well. So tonight I will be talking about dreams in the book of Brayfeet. And I will be talking about three dreams that occur in Safer Brayfeet. When it comes to the subject of dreams in Judaism, there's definitely more than one point of view. In Jewish thought, dreams not only have significance, but they can even be out-of-body experiences where the person receives an important message. In Parshat Vayeshev, where we read about Yosef's dreams, the Abarbanel writes that dreams are the revelation of disorganized thoughts that are suppressed during waking hours and released during sleep. He says these dreams are vain, have no meaning, and have no effect one way or the other. It also says in the Talmud in Sanhedrin, 38, that the words of dreams neither elevate nor cause to descend. In other words, dreams don't mean anything. In Zechariah and Kohelet, we also find Sukim that state that dreams are full of fiction and falsehoods produced by an overactive or anxious imagination. The Shulchan Aruch recommends that if a person has a seemingly bad dream and is upset by it, they should gather three friends and tell them the dream. Then their friends should do what is called a hatavat halam and find a creative way to interpret the dream positively. The Talmud in Bracha tells the story of a man by the name of Barhania who interpreted dreams nicely if you paid him and badly if you didn't. The scholars Rava and Abaye had the same dream based on upsetting Sukim in the Torah and he offered opposite interpretations for Abaye who paid him and Rava who did not. The Talmud says that the realization of all dreams follows the mouth, or in other words, the meaning of a dream depends upon the interpretation given to it. The Talmud quotes Rav Banaha, who says that there were 24 interpreters of dreams living in Yerushalayim. Now he says, once I dreamt a dream and I went to each of them to ask for its interpretation, and that which this one interpreted to me was not the same as that which the other one interpreted to me. Rather, I received 24 interpretations for the same dream. Yet all of these interpretations were realized for me, as indeed each predicted event in fact materialized. According to the statement of the Talmud then, there is no such thing as a negative or positive dream. If a dream is, in, is interpreted positively, it becomes a positive dream. And if interpreted negatively, it becomes a negative dream. Theoretically, a dream can be negative and positive at the same time, depending on its interpretation. However, this view is contradicted by most of Talmudic literature that talks about dreams. The Talmud states that Rav Chista said, a positive dream is not destined to be fulfilled in its entirety, nor is a negative dream. This is derived from the fact that in one of his dreams, Yosef saw, in addition to the 11 stars, the sun and the moon reflecting his two parents, Yaakov and, and Rachel, who would also become subservient to him. This is despite the fact that Rachel's mother actually passed away before the dream was realized years later in Egypt. Rabbi Dov Linzer says that when we read stories in the Torah about people's dreams, they serve as messages from Hashem, as ways in which Hashem communicates with us. We also read in the Torah that Hashem speaks to the Nevi'im through dreams, as it says in Bamidbar, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. In a dream, I will speak unto him. Rabbi Linzer goes on to say, if we perceive our dreams as coming from Hashem, they can be a powerful way in which he can be a, present in our, a presence in our lives. But taking that approach also contains within it a danger. It can give us license to act in certain questionable ways because we believe that we are actually on a mission from God. Because Yosef believed that Hashem had shown him in his dreams that his brothers would bow down to him 
he felt justified in acting in ways that raised serious ethical questions in order to make these dreams come true. Now let's take a look at three different dreams that we read about in the Torah. Yaakov's dream as he leaves his home to escape from Esau, Yosef's dreams about his family, and Paro's dreams. So first we have Yaakov. Yaakov is forced to flee the land of Israel after angering his brother Esau. Here is a description of Yaakov's dream when he stops between Beersheba and Haran one night. In the Torah it says, Yaakov left Beersheba and set out for Haran. He came upon the certain place and stopped there for the night, for the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream. A stairway was set on the earth, and its top reached to the sky, and angels of God were going up and down on it. And the Lord was standing beside him, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The ground on which you are lying I will assign to you and to your offspring. Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you and your descendants. Remember, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is present in this place, and I did not know it. Shaken, he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the abode of God, and that is a gateway to heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He named this, that site Beit El, but previously the name of the city had been Luz. The stairway that Yaakov climbed in his dream was viewed by Fazal as a symbol that represents and links different worlds. A Midrash and Breshit Rabbah interpreted the dream as follows. The stairway refers to the incline which leans to the temple altar. The words stationed on the earth refers to the altar and the words and its top reaches the sky refers to the offerings whose fragrance rises to heaven. And the words and behold the angels of God refers to the high priests ascending and descending on it, refers to the angels as they ascend and descend on the incline and the words and behold God stands above it refers to a Pasuk and Amos where it says, I saw God standing on the altar. The rabbis also say an alternative word on this matter. And behold a stairway, this is Sinai, for the numerology of the letters of ladder are, are equal to those of Sinai as they both add up to 130. So it's a little bit of gematria for you. In an article by Rabbi Alan S. Maller, he says, that Yaakov's dream is unusual because no interpretation of the dream is given in the Torah. This teaches us that if we want to connect to heaven, the Torah is our ladder, and we have to ascend to heaven by our, own, by our own efforts. For example, study of the Torah text. That is why even the angels first ascend and then descend. Rabbi Miller quotes Rabbi Yanai, who says, the ladder represented Yaakov. Yaakov had ups and downs, strengths and failures. Now he learned that flawed as he was, he could still receive Hashem's blessing and be in Hashem's presence, even if he didn't know it at that time. Rabbi Mahler also suggests that the latter represents the, fu the future generations of Yaakov's children, the Jewish people. They will reach great heights and descend to the depths, live in times of prosperity, as well as times of persecution. And through all this, they will ma maintain their continuity. Then we have Yosef's dreams. We have Yosef's dreams about his family, and they are described in Parshat Vayeshev, starting in Perak Lamed Zion, Pasuk Vav. And it says, he said to them, hear this dream which I have dreamed. There were binding sheaves in the field. When suddenly my sheaf stood up, I remained upright. Then your sheaves gathered around and bowed low to my sheaf. His brothers answered, do you mean to reign over us? Do you mean to rule over us? And they hated him even more for his talk about his dreams. He dreamed another dream and told it to his brother saying, look, I have had another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his father and brothers, his father berated him. What he said to him, is this dream you have dreamed? Are we to come and I, your mother and your brothers and bow low to you to the ground? 
Rabbi Pinchas Winston says that the Talmud and Brachos discusses dreams and their interpretations at length. However, as I previously mentioned, the dream goes after the interpretation. In other words, dreams are a potential that become actualized once they are interpreted and verbalized. Otherwise, says the Talmud, they're like an unread letter. You will notice that Yosef never bothered to offer an interpretation of his own dreams. Instead, he simply relayed to the rest of the family each time what he saw in his dream. It was the brothers first and then Yaakov who interpreted Yosef's dreams. If the dreams go after the interpretation, then according to the Talmud, it was the brothers who had pronounced royalty on Yosef with their own interpretation of his dreams. So why blame Yosef? Rav Yaakov Midan suggests that Yosef's problem is not only that he goes and tells his father and his brothers about his dreams, but that he has these dreams in the first place. It would seem from here that a person dreams about what his heart is already reflecting on. So if Yosef dreams that he would rule over his father's entire house, he must already have been thinking in that direction. And that led to his dream. Rabbi Yehonas son Geffen says that before we hear about Yosef's dreams, the Torah portion talks about the deterioration of the relationship between Yosef and his brothers. Yosef's two dreams played a very significant part in the increasing resentment of the brothers towards him. Rabbi Geffen quotes the Beis HaLevi, Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, who notes that the Torah tells us after the first dream that the brothers hated Yosef, whereas after the second dream, it does not state that they hated him, rather that they were jealous of him. So what is the reason for this difference? The Beis HaLevi answers this by examining the dreams more carefully. In the first dream, Yosef said that he and his brothers were in the field and that their sheaves stood up and bowed down to his sheaf. He did not say that the brothers themselves bowed down to him. However, in the second dream though, he compares them to stars and said that they bowed down to him. In this dream, the stars represented the brothers and that they themselves bowed directly to Yosef. The Basilevi explains that the two dreams represented two separate areas in which, in which the brothers would become subservient and inferior to Yosef. The sheaves in the first dream represented Yosef's future superiority over the brothers in the realm of success in this world. The bowing of their sheaves to his indicated that they would be dependent upon him for their physical sustenance. However, success in the physical realm does not make a person intrinsically superior to others, the Beis Halevi says. Rather, it means that he has more possessions. Accordingly, a wealthy person is not on a higher level than a pauper. Based on this, the Beis Halevi explains that in the first dream, which re represented physicality or, or Gashmiut, the brothers themselves did not show their subservience to Yosef. Rather, their physical possessions are shown to be inferior to those, to those of their brother. In contrast, the second dream refers to Yosef's future spiritual superiority over the brothers. Spiritual accomplishments do define the intrinsic greatness of a person. Accordingly, in the second dream, which represented spirituality, the brothers themselves bowed to Yosef, indicating his in inherent spiritual spiritual superiority over them. This explains why after the first dream, the brothers hated Yosef, where, whereas following the second dream, they were jealous of him. According to the Beis Halevi, hatred results when one resents another person's actions, whereas jealousy arises when one feels inferior to his fellow. The brothers hated Yosef after the first dream because of its implication that they would need him for their sustenance and he would physically rule over them. However, they were not jealous of him because the prospect of his greater wealth did not make them feel inferior to him. They saw physical attainment as something external to a person and therefore not worthy of jealousy. In contrast, they were jealous of him after the second dream because that implied that he would be spiritually superior to them and this could indeed arouse their jealousy. According to Rabbi Eliyahu Hoffman, Yosef's dreams, the brothers' sheaves bowing down to his and the stars, moon, and sun bowing to him seem very similar in nature at first glance, but there are significant differences. 
Both dreams hint at Yosef's future rise to greatness. But the ballet to Safot raises the following question. In Parshat Miketz, Paro also has two dreams, seven thin cows swallowing seven fat ones, and seven thin ears of grain swallowing seven full ones. Yosef correctly interprets, interprets this to mean that there will be seven years of plenty followed by seven years of hunger. He says, and as for the repetition of the dream to Paro twice, it is because the matter is already prepared before God and God is hastening to do it. So why then in Yosef's case, where his dreams were also repeated, did it take so long before he would begin his rise to greatness in Egypt? Rabbi Hoffman asks why Yosef waited all those years to contact his family, knowing how much his father was suffering. The Ramban answers that Yosef's dreams were a form of prophecy that he knew must be fulfilled. The first dream has all, his all of his brothers bowing to him without Yaakov. This is why, says the Ramban, he insisted that Binyamin come back with his brothers. Until the first dream had been fully realized, he could not reveal himself for doing so would bring Yaakov as well. And that was already encroaching on the territory of the second dream. So according to this Ramban, we now understand that there was a reason why Yosef had two dreams and that they were not the exact same dream. His brothers would bow to him twice, but once without their father and once with him. Alex Israel asks why Yosef's brothers reacted so strongly to his dreams and attempted to kill him. He says the brothers could have just avoided him or kept away from him or stopped speaking to him. Instead, why were they driven to, to murder? He suggests that Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch's interpretation of the dream gives us the beginning of a direction. This is what Rav Shimshon Raphael Hirsch says. It is remarkable that he should have dreamt of binding sheaves. That was something with which ordinarily they had no connection. They were shepherds. To become an agricultural people lay for them still as their destiny in the distant future. If agricultural was so much in his mind that he even dreamt of it, the brothers were justified in thinking that could only be due to the teaching and information given to him by his father, Yaakov, over the expected national destiny of the house. All the more then could the brothers believe themselves justified in saying, will you indeed in the future be king over us? or perhaps even now already rule over us. Such a thought should not occur even in a dream. Rev Hirsch points out that the brothers never bound sheaves. They were actually sheep farmers. They would only become agriculturalists once they settled the land of Israel. It is about this reality that Yosef dreams, and it is precisely in the arena of political leadership of a future Jewish state that Yosef sees himself as leader. Yosef is putting down his own nomination for national leadership. Alex Israel says that the 12 sons of Yaakov, from all that we hear about them, seem fully aware that they're not just any family. They know that this is a family who will become a nation. The leadership of the nation is at stake. Now Yosef is the pretender to the throne. That is a reason to raise the brother's blood to boiling point. They are up in arms, as they say to him. Are you really telling us that you intend to take the leadership for yourself? Who are you? Who do you think you are? What about the Leah faction of this family? And as we are reminded so frequently in this painful world of ours, power struggles do not bring out the best in people. Rather, they often lead to conflict and bloodshed. And this was no exception. Then we go on to the dreams that Paro had later on in Breshi. And Paro's dreams are described as follows. We have the first description in the Torah of the first dream. Behold, he stood at the river, and behold, from the river there rose seven cows of beautiful appearance and fat, and they grazed in the reed grass. And behold, another seven cows arose after them from the river of bad appearance and thin, and they stood by the other cows upon the bank of the river. And the cows of bad appearance and thin consumed the seven cows of good appearance and fat. The first description of the second dream in the Torah that Paro has goes as follows. And behold, seven ears of corn arose on the same stalk, healthy and good. And behold, seven, seven ears that were thin 
and blasted by the east wind sprang up after them. And the seven thin ears swallowed up the seven ears that were healthy and full. Rabbi Shmuel Kogan asks, when Paro had his two dreams, he wasn't short of, inter of interpretations and meanings. It says that Par Paro sent and called all the necromancers of Egypt and all its sages and related to them his dream. But no one interpreted them for Paro, meaning not one of them offered an interpretation which satisfied Paro. So why did Paro accept Yosef's translation of his dreams? Rabbi Kogan answers that Yosef solved the question that no one else could answer. At one point in Paro's dream, he saw the seven skinny cows at the same time that he saw the fat ones. Then in the second dream, he saw the skinny beaten ears of grain together with the healthy ones. No one seemed to figure out how there could be both the good and the bad at the exact same time. As we know, Yosef interpreted the dreams as follows. The seven fat cows and healthy ears represented seven years of plenty. The skinny cows and beaten ears represented seven years of extreme famine. Yosef then continued to give his advice, which clarified everything. During the first set of seven years, they should harvest and store as much grain as possible so that when the seven years of famine arrived, the Egyptians will have what to eat. By offering this advice, Yosef addressed the issue of having the bad at the same time as the good. During the first seven years, the second set of seven years of famine was already in existence as they were, as they were preparing for it by collecting and storing all the surplus grain. When the famine finally arrived, although nothing grew from the earth, the first set of seven years was still at their side as they had all the food from that period stored away already. And this is why the seven skinny cows stood side by side with the seven fat cows. Professor Jonathan Grossman answers the same question as Rabbi Kogan. He says that the fact that Paro refuses to accept the suggestions of the magicians indicates that he has some kind of sign as to who would interpret correctly. In dealing with a dream of such significance, Paro did not wish, wish to leave the solution in the hands of any interpreter who appeared sufficiently creative. He wanted to be sure of the correct interpretation. How did he go about this? By making small changes to the details of the dreams when he recounts them to the, magi to the magicians and to Yosef. The Torah repeats the dreams and that's where we notice the differences in the retelling. In the original description of the dream we read, and behold, from the river arose seven cows, and behold, seven other cows arose after them, and they stood next to the cows on the river bank. In Paro's description of the dream, the last part is omitted, and behold, from the river arose seven cows, and behold, seven other cows arose after them. That's it. No mention is made of the two set, sets of cows standing side by side before the lean ones consume the fat ones. Paro omits this detail on purpose, but invents another. In the original description we read, it says, and the bad looking lean cows consumed the seven good looking healthy cows and Paro woke up. But when Paro recounts the dream, he says, and the lean and bad cows consumed the first healthy cows. And when they were inside them, it could not be known that they had been consumed for their appearance was as bad as it had been at first. And then I woke up. Sorry, one second. By making these changes to the recounting of his dreams, Paro was able to see who would correctly interpret them and who would be led astray by these incorrect details. Professor Grossman says that it should be emphasized that Paro apparently understood that this was no regular dream, but rather a divine message. Which, which caused his spirit to be troubled. The genuine interpreter of such a dream would certainly know how to distinguish between the use of the essence of the message and an insignificant detail, between the dream itself and Paro's personal additions, between what was related and the hidden message. It seems that Paro's magicians all fell into the trap he had laid for them and based their, inter their interpretations of the dream on the fact 
that the lean cows grew no fatter after consuming the healthy cows, or suggested interpretations which ignored the image of the two sets of cows standing side by side. Paro knew that all of their solutions were to be rejected. But when Yosef interprets the dreams and actually proposes a reorganization of the Egyptian national economy as a means of dealing with the years of famine, Paro knows that Yosef's interpretation is the correct interpretation. Rev. Tamir Granat asks, why is Paro struck with terror when he hears Yosef's interpretation of his dreams? Why does he believe that the decree of famine is absolute, that it will bring about annihilation? While Yosef immediately understands that the famine is something that can be dealt with. He says that this reflects more than just the personality structure of each of the two characters involved, Yosef and Paro. It also goes deeper than the simple fact of Yosef's keener understanding of the dreams. Rather, Yosef's view is an expression of a Jewish way of handling a harsh reality, while Paro's view is the expression of a pagan consciousness. Paro lives within a deterministic consciousness. If something has been decreed, there is nothing to be done, certainly not on the level of practical action. Reality weighs down on us, and all we can do is to recognize it. Yosef presents Paro with the Jewish alternative, that reality is admittedly harsh, but it should be perceived not as a disaster, but rather as a mission and responsibility. The famine is a fact, but the task of leadership is to find ways of dealing with the suffering that, is likely, that it is likely to cause. This is precisely the spirit of Yosef's proposal. And it is for this purpose that he is appointed. Thus, when Paro says, is there any man like this with the spirit of God within him? He refers especially to the particularly Jewish spirit of God by virtue of which Yosef knew the correct solution. And now I'd like to finish with a quote by Rabbi Dov Linzer that talks about the act of dreaming that I found very inspirational. He says, but God is not absent from this experience when he talks about dreaming. We were created in God's image and that yearning soul that strives for the full realization of its potential is the divine within us that surfaces in our dreams. What we aspire for, what we envision as our possible future, what we dream for when we are awake, that is the 160th of prophecy that speaks to us in our dreams when we sleep. That doesn't mean that these dreams will become real. It is we who must provide the other 59 parts of this equation. A dream follows its interpretation. If we see and experience it as nothing other than an artifact of our subconscious, then that is all that it will be. If however, we see it as a vision of a possible future, then we can help it come true. That is not always a good thing. When our fears and anxieties surface in our dreams, they can take hold of us. We can find ourselves on a, sub on a subconscious level at least, feeding into these anxieties and enabling them to be actualized. This prophecy may become self-fulfilling and not for the better. The same can be true in the reverse. Dreams that speak to us about our yearnings and aspirations can serve as prods to push us to achieve what is possible, even if those dreams appear distant and out of reach. As we know, vis visualization is a powerful tool that can help a person achieve any goal. If we give our dreams interpretation of a, of a possible future, we can make them one sixtieth of prophecy. We can partner with God in making our dreams come true. Thank you very much. Um, I guess if anybody has any comments or questions, now would be the time. <laughs> and if there are questions, I hope I can answer them. <laughs> Can't guarantee though. <laughs> oh. Not too many. Yes, Sharko Khech. Um, Marcy, I just wanted to ask, are you willing, just because that was so rich, are you willing to share the written version of the Dvar Torah for those of us who might want to read it over? One sure. Time because there is a lot to absorb. Yes. Yes. No, I'm happy to. I'm very happy to. Okay. Thanks. I'll drop you an email afterwards. Okay. Sure. Oh, we got free. 
Yes, I know there was there was a lot there. It looks like Shana has a question. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm unmuted. Yes. So, um, Marcy, I, I read at the beginning, you quoted the Abrav and Alan. I was struck by how modern seeming his approach was to analysis of dreams. This sense of, you know, that they're the kind of sorting out of um, the jumble of thoughts that don't get properly put into little boxes during the day. And then at night, your brain takes over and says, oh, this is about that. I'll put it with this. Do you know, it was that... I know I, I'm trying to remember, was Abravanel a doctor? No, he was a courtier, I think, and a diplomat, but I don't remember him being a doctor. I I have to say, I don't remember him being a doctor either. If there's anybody oh. on this chat that can add to this, please do. Because <laughs> I it was very striking to me how modern it was. Wait, I will Google and report. Okay. I think you're I, I agree with you, Shana. It's it's very modern. It sounds very modern to me. Oh. I have a question. Hi, Marcy. Hi, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. That was really great. There was like a lot of, Thank yeah, you. like a lot of new things that I had not heard or considered. It was really good. I guess also since we started talking about the Barbanel, um, so you, you brought like a lot of different interpretations at the beginning in terms of, you know, commentators, I guess, like the Abarbanel who sort of say, oh, it's just your brain, you know, trying to sort things out. And then, um, and a few other, you know, uh, commentators who say, yeah, dreams don't actually have a lot of, a lot of meaning um, or the very interesting twist of they don't have meaning until they're interpreted, which I think is kind of, kind of neat. Um, but, mm -hmm. but would you, would you say though that, that, and I think you mentioned this story, so just to clarify for myself, um, is that the sort of minority opinion though? Like, would, would you say that, um, did you, or did you say that the sort of most of the um, comments in the Gemara and, and, you know, biblical commentators would say that yes, dreams do actually have, have meaning. So in other words, the Barbadell is kind of in the minority in that opinion. Um, I'm, or I'm thinking because, you know, like I, I partially cherry picked what I took out and put into the, in, into this dvar so um i i couldn't tell you for sure like how many people say one thing and how many people say the other thing i just took what i liked what i heard um i have to say <laughs> i i totally <laughs> and what made sense to me <laughs> you for that. <laughs> i think i was it was more that i just want to show that there was more than one opinion really mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I don't, yeah, I don't know what the majority opinion is. It was yeah. just the fact that there was more than one opinion that I wanted to show. So I'm sorry, that doesn't exactly answer your no. question. <laughs> That's all right. But at this point, you're definitely more of the expert. So just thought I'd ask you. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, were there any other questions or comments? I know there there was a lot of material there. Yes, it's it was uh, it was very interesting just finding all of it and putting it together. I have to say, um, this is actually a topic I had been thinking about more than a year ago, um, and I just that I wanted to write a divorce tour about, but I just didn't know exactly when the opportunity would come up. And and I'm sorry I didn't talk about something having to do with of, but when I had the opportunity to give it to our tour, I figured, you know what, here's my opportunity to finally talk about the dreams. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Marcy, very much. I think um, a my lot pleasure. of us are inclined to sort of just, um, you know, wake up and be like, oh, that was a weird dream and then not think about it anymore. And I think yeah. I, I really enjoyed the interpretation that you had that's just, you know, once you actually like interpret it, it actually provides it with some meaning, either good or bad, and then you can decide what you do with that. So I think it does provide, you know, just some additional thought, like tomorrow waking up, okay, maybe I need to think about, you know, what I actually dreamt about a bit more. 
So thank you, I think, for um, you know, making us a bit more aware of our own dreams. My pleasure, my absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. So if anyone is interested um, in giving the Elul Dvar Torah, that is still available. So reach out to either the Shul or to Jonathan Parker, um, and you can be added into the rotation. So um, yes. yeah, if there's no other comments or questions, we can we can sign off. But Marcy, yeah, if you are willing to share your actual written words from from your uh, that you were reading, that I'm sure a lot of people would really enjoy that. So sure. um, think about that. So actually, um, my email address for, for people who want copies, it's A-U-N-T-I-E-M-A-R-C-Y at gmail.com. So antimarcy at gmail.com. Feel free to send me an email and then I can email it back to you. Sounds great. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Have an easy fast. Yes.